Good afternoon. That's your signal to sort of <laughs> pipe down a little bit. Uh, welcome, welcome uh, to this uh, session, which I think will be uh, terrific. Welcome to uh, this marvelous conference of the American Constitution Society. Uh, this is uh, an open session, as I understand it, uh, which means it doesn't require IDs or money. And I think uh, for a public service session, uh, that's particularly congenial. So thank you for coming. Um, my name is Gene Nickel. I'm from the University of North Carolina. Uh, the ACS folks have asked me to moderate uh, this panel. Uh, as I look around, I, there are several reasons that's probably true. Uh, first of which is I'm the only old geezer uh, on the panel. I'm the only sort of useless male uh, on the panel. So uh, I will be less interesting than everyone else. That's a good prediction, uh, and I think uh, I'm glad to play that role. Um, the, this is a timely and uh, sort of challenging and compelling session. Uh, it could be described, I suppose, as the challenge of public service in immensely trying times, and some of you know even more about those economically challenging times or tough job markets uh, than uh, some of us do, perhaps. Uh, but you've got four, uh, let me put aside, you've got four immensely interesting and sort of different paths into public service, uh, interesting stories and uh, interesting advice, I think, who will come from these folks. And also at least a glimmer of innovative and creative ways to engage in public interest practice that maybe we haven't seen so much in the past. Let me quickly introduce the panelists to you, um, and I'll go in uh, alphabetical order. Uh, uh, Representative uh, Chrysanta Duran is uh, from the State House in Colorado. Uh, we were talking just before, I remember 20 years ago, doing my very best to pack a district uh, for uh, Representative Duran. Uh, didn't know she was coming along, didn't know how good the results were going to be. Uh, and as it turned out, she didn't even need the PAC district. She is uh, uh, such a terrific uh, candidate. Uh, but uh, uh, she practices law in Denver as well. She went to the University of Denver undergraduate and then cured that by going to the University of Colorado uh, for uh, law school, which is uh, her home then took public service by the horns, uh, getting elected, uh, winning a seat in the Colorado House at the age of 29. Uh, I have some experience in losing races at early ages, but the, the idea of actually winning one is uh, <laughs> fascinating. Um, uh, uh, next, uh, we'll hear from uh, Shauna Huey, who is a senior uh, advisor to uh, Nashville Mayor Carl Dean, uh, engaging in public legal service work, We're right in the mayor's office, right where it belongs. But as many of you know, uh, before that, uh, Shauna was uh, nominations counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee, so uh, working for Senator Leahy, and there are a lot of young lawyers who owe her jobs, even some older ones uh, like Sotomayor and Kagan. Uh, so she will have, uh, I think, particular and pointed advice for us. Uh, on my left here is Kathleen Morris, uh, from, a professor from Golden Gate, uh, who is now involved in interesting and innovative uh, legal structures out of uh, law schools in terms of uh, uh, powerful public interest litigation uh, that grew out of her work in the city attorney's office in San Francisco, uh, work that she began with the marvelous uh, uh, Heather Gergen, uh, who, which began here, began at one of these uh, conferences. So be careful who you pay attention to. If you see any uh, Yale law professors, sort of grab them by the neck and uh, see if you can't talk them into something. She's also uh, taught at uh, slouch places like Yale and uh, Berkeley. Uh, 
Um, uh, next, uh, we'll hear from Amanda Tyler, uh, who is Ways and Means Counsel for Congressman Lloyd Doggett. Lloyd Doggett, who uh, for over 40 years has worked hard to bring sanity to the state of Texas, uh, obviously with only very modest success. Um, uh, I am also from the University of Texas. That's right. I have been uh, lucky to do some interesting work in my life, uh, but the job that I coveted the most when I was a third-year law student was working for Lloyd Doggett. Uh, now that I've met Amanda, I see why I didn't exactly measure up, and so uh, never had much of a chance. Uh, Nick asked me to start off, and I'm going to do that uh, very briefly, first of all, because whenever anybody's moderating a panel and they say that they've, asked, they've been asked to address the substance of the program, I never believe them, and I doubt that uh, you do either. But sort of, I'll be very brief, sort of very brief. Setting the stage just a, a bit, though, everyone knows the setting uh, that leads to this these discussions. There has never been an adequate infrastructure for public service work in law, not even before the crash of legal markets that occurred six or seven years ago. Uh, so uh, these good panelists are going to talk about some different paths, some uh, unfolding structures. I'm just going to offer four kind of mini points. Um, first is this. There's a silver lining to every cloud. Uh, it has never been clearer, in my lifetime anyway, or I don't think anyone else's, uh, that the profession of law is meant to be a calling of public service, doing what Daniel Webster called, of course, the great work of humans on earth, achieving justice. I've never been able to see any other reason for it. Uh, now it's become clear that that's the case uh, across the board. Uh, so there's an advantage to having our mission clarified, and we surely do in this day and time. It's also clear that there has never been a greater need, given our disparities of power and equality, there's never been a greater need for lawyering in the public service. Second, there are all these barriers that uh, and my remarks are going to be a lot addressed to the young lawyers here. There are all these barriers that you face uh, at this stage in your career. I wish you didn't. I wish they uh, weren't as challenging as they are. When I graduated from law school, all you had to do was sort of roll off a log to get a good job, and there's no fairness in that. Uh, but I would say this. Don't tell yourself and don't tell me that you know what's possible, what the limits are, what's practical, what can be done what's possible to accomplish and what's not from your young vantage point. Uh, I recall a conversation, a sort of late, late night conversation I had a few years ago with uh, the great uh, John Lewis uh, when we talked about that very thing. And so you just imagine telling John Lewis that the barriers you face today are too daunting. <laughs> I dare you to do that. Third, the best things in life often have confusing economics attached to them. The only really good career decision I ever made was leaving work about 35 years ago as a modestly successful and happy trial lawyer. Long time ago, I was making, I think, $85,000 a year. I took my first uh, teaching job at West Virginia University for $13,000 a year. I tried to explain this to my father, who was a depression kid uh, in rural Texas never been to college. He didn't think I had made a mistake. He thought that I needed to be institutionalized. <laughs> uh, and I explained to him that, well, it, it seemed to me that being a law professor was more fun and more challenging and more inspirational uh, than being a lawyer. And I remember very clearly him saying, boy, I've been working for 50 years and fun hadn't got a goddamn thing to do with it. So. Uh, <laughs> It's not always true that the economics prevail. Last, I would say, if legal markets are crap, which in some ways they are, and if legal education and its structure adds to those uh, sort of difficulties or that crap, 
I would think, I'm, I mean this seriously, I think there's no generation which is better fixed to face those difficulties and challenges than this one is. I've had the odd experience in the last decade of spending about half of it working with undergraduates. And with undergraduates, it's almost clearer. But there's truth to this notion that your generation would rather go out and create and make up a job than search and find one. And if the legal structure, the legal markets, ever needed that kind of innovation, that kind of creativity, uh, they need it now. And you are the, I think you're the generation that is best equipped to do it. So I am confident uh, in the long run you are on this front uh, very clearly going to prevail. That said, I will uh, turn over the podium to our uh, speakers, and I'll start with Representative Duran. Thank you so much. Um, it is a great opportunity to be here with all of you tonight. I flo flew in from Denver um, this morning and uh, made it here safely. And I'm very excited to talk with you about the future of public service, and to me that means the future of our country. Um, I graduated from law school in 2005, and I, like maybe many of you, decided to go to law school because I wanted to change the world. I wanted to use a legal degree as a tool to be able to make sure that we have economic opportunity in this country um, for everyone, regardless of whether you're, what background you're from, regardless of uh, race, creed, a variety of different things. To me, that was really what drove me to get to law school in the first place. And I had a long history before the time I went to law school of being involved with social justice issues. I can remember at the age of 15, 16 years old, traveling to Watsonville, California with a group of college students and high school students to attend a march where we were marching on behalf of strawberry workers who were trying to organize in the United Farm Workers of America. And there's days I remember in law school and thereafter where I feel like sometimes I have a bad day. And every time I think about the days that I have a bad day, I think about workers who are out in the fields without any sort of real protections, working for large companies, being subject to sexual harassment, being subject to unsafe working conditions, and it's always reminded me to always be very thankful of the opportunities that I've had. So when I graduated from law school, um, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do, and so I ended up going to go work for a labor organization uh, that represented grocery workers, and I was there for several years before I decided to run for office. And when I finally decided to run for office, it was because, quite frankly, I was frustrated. I was frustrated that we weren't doing enough in this country on behalf of working families. I was frustrated that we weren't doing enough to see immigration reform. I was frustrated that the American dream was not a reality for most Americans. And at the age of 29, I decided I was going to just jump in to a race <laughs> and run for state representative. Um, and I'll tell you, the one thing that I can say about that is that there is so much talent amongst, I think, the next generation of this country. And politics is changing dramatically as well, where we see more and more people from different backgrounds, not your typical backgrounds, getting into politics, running for office, or even if you're not running for office, getting involved with a campaign and going to go work for somebody who is running for office. And I think that it's so important that you always keep that in mind, keeping in mind the ability that you have to be able to use your law degree to really affect the lives of people. We know that the United States continues to be one of the best countries to live in, um, but that doesn't mean that we have not had obstacles and don't continue to have obstacles. And even today, if we are honest with ourselves, we know that still too few have access to equal rights, too few have protection of privacy, and that women continue to try and receive equal pay for equal work in a variety of different fields. And there's a lot of, and whatever your story is or whatever brought you to law school and whatever brought you to the practice and whatever ideals that you had, we know that we still have a lot to do in this country and nationally. And so the decision to run for office or help somebody else can truly 
lead to incredible victories for the people that you represent. Um, this past legislative session, we had a historic legisla legislative session in the state of Colorado, um, where for the first time we passed civil unions. We passed Colorado Asset, a bill so that undocumented students will be able to receive in-state tuition. We passed a new renewable energy standard. We did things that Colorado has not seen for years, and quite frankly, that the country hasn't seen for years. And so don't ever undervalue the opportunity and the power of being involved with public service from a very, with a very hands-on approach. Um, and think about running for office. Think about helping candidates to run for office because it is a, truly a meaningful way to be able to get things done for your community and for your state and for your country. So I will leave it at that for now. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, uh, going through that list of legislative accomplishments, Colorado's changed just a little bit a little since bit. Uh, no uh, I was out there. Plus, I don't know if you noticed this, uh, uh, Representative Duran said, you know, when I finally decided to run for office at 29. So I hope you guys are uh, uh, gearing up. Uh, <laughs> You're behind. TikTok. Uh, well, that was, that was really inspiring. And, um, I've always worked for people like Representative Duran, so my, my, my take is a little bit more, um, I, I think we probably all share this common desire to go work for somebody like this or be somebody like her, and how the heck do you get those jobs? I think that it, so I've heard from people that sometimes you feel like you're just sending a resume into a black hole, you know, and, and a lot of like, people want to do what we all want to do, and, and how, do, how do you do that? Um, so just two seconds about my career path. Um, my, my first foray into politics uh, was as an Oval Office intern in the Clinton White House. So I went from there, um, and then I worked for Vice President Gore. I got on Senator Stabenow from Michigan's campaign while I was still in college. Graduated, went to become her press secretary. Um, went from that to law school, clerked for Chairman Leahy when he was on the, while well, I was in law school and he was on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, took a brief and confusing foray into the conventional world of law where I uh, spent a very brief period of time at a law firm and then got my head back and, and went and uh, worked for Chairman Leahy for a few years on the Judiciary Committee, it moved to Nashville, and now I work for Mayor Carl Dean. So if you haven't heard of him, remember his name. He's an absolute rock star from Tennessee. So the point of all of that is that... This is a country star, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, he, he really is incredible, and we almost got him on the show Nashville, but it got cut, and it was a really sad day for everybody in the mayor's office. Um, anyway, so my, my point in saying all of that is I have always worked for an individual candidate or an individual politician, and so the advice that I'm going to give now, it, it may be generally applicable, but it, it's probably most applies to those of you who are looking for jobs in those kinds of offices. And I think it's hard because if you're in law school, at least my law school, it tended to, there was a formula, and if you fit that formula, then hooray, you could go get a job at a big law firm, right? And the, and the school tended to funnel people that way. So if you got good grades and you were on law review and you then did a federal clerkship, then it kind of spits you out into the firm world. And, and I was thinking to myself, so that, that's a formula, right? Like grades plus law review plus clerkship equals law firm. And there is, or at least I've made one up, kind of a, a formula that I think you might be able to apply to public service jobs. And, and part of it is your educational background. Um, and part of it is the sense that you're a true believer. And part of it is the sense that you get it. And so I'm going to talk just real briefly about what all those things mean. Um, so your educational background, I think the quality of that and what's required um, on your transcript might depend on where you work. So when I went into work at the Judiciary Committee, I remember sitting at my desk and thinking, how did I get here? Because all of these people around me have the most amazing educational pedigrees, and I, w I was just... I, I've been lucky to almost always have jobs where I think, wow, I can't believe I get to sit in this chair. I feel so lucky. But looking at the educational backgrounds of most people on the Judiciary Committee, they've got that truly incredible transcript. And, and depending on where you go, depending on how selective it is, that may be necessary, it may not. But more important than that is, is proof on your resume that you are a true believer. And so when I was on the Judiciary Committee, I ran the uh, law clerk program. And so, you know, many hundreds of eager and talented law students every year apply to go clerk 
for Chairman Leahy on the Judiciary Committee. And so I was weeding through those resumes, and one of the things that we were looking for was evidence of somebody who's a true believer. And so what does that, what does that mean? I mean, if you're sitting there and you're the one weeding through those resumes, there's a pretty good chance that you have sacrificed a lot of time and probably taken a lot of pay cuts to do jobs that feel important to you, that you really believe in. And when you're looking through those resumes, you are looking for people who've done that same kind of thing, right? And it doesn't mean that you have to have started in politics when you were 19. It doesn't mean that you have to have a ton of full-time positions, but you've you should have something on your resume that shows, I made the sacrifice, you know, I'm on the same team, I've been out there fighting for these causes too. Um, so education plus true believer plus this really intangible thing that I was trying to describe to a friend today, and it, it's really hard to explain what I mean, but it really helps if you can just, if you just get it. And, and I don't know how to sum that up, but I can tell you that kind of the death knell of a law clerk or, or somebody that we were hiring in our office would be if somebody came to you and said, mm, she just doesn't get it. And, and, and so what does, that, what does that mean? In some sense it means to, to get it is to understand that when you're working for an individual, and this is in my personal opinion, but when you're working for them, you get it when you get that it is just not about you. It's not about wanting to have FaceTime with the candidate. It's not about your own personal advancement. And I think that might be a little bit different than life at a law firm, where I think it's okay for you to go in and say, hey, I'm here and I want to be partner someday. Hey, I'm here and I want to make this much in my bonus. In public service, I think because people so deeply believe in the candidate, you, to get it, you really need to, to believe in them too and, and to not be as concerned with personal advancement. Um, and the hard part about the getting it part is you can't really show that on a transcript, right? Like when you're sending in your application to go be a law clerk in the Senate, you, you can't, there's nothing you can really write to prove that you get it. And it's almost like saying, yeah, I'm normal. Because as soon as you said I'm normal, it means you're like not really normal. And so <laughs> if you say I get it, it, it may mean that same kind of thing, right? But so what, in my experience, you need to, you need somebody who can vouch for you. You need a sponsor who can, who can call the person who's hiring and say, mm, yep, this person gets it. Like, this is going to be a good person to have with you in the trenches. This person is a true believer. And so if you're out there thinking, well, how on earth am I going to find a sponsor? How do I demonstrate that I get it? I get it. I know I do. But how do I prove to these employers that I get it? Um, my advice to you would be go get some of that true believer experience on your resume because that's where you meet people who can be your sponsors. And don't, don't think that it's the candidate or the principal, you know, the elected official that you're working for. They're not going to be your best sponsor. Your best sponsor is probably somebody you've never heard of in your life. It's going to be your direct boss, you know, the, camp, the campaign manager. or It's going to be a deputy. It's going to be somebody who you're going to work with and you're going to prove that you get it. And those kinds of people will be your sponsors. Um, so go out there and... Get some true believer experience. <laughs> did you practice at O'Malveny? I did practice at okay. O'Malveny. It was I just a lovely to, law firm. I wanted to translate that uh, sort of veering off into <laughs> disgust. Um, th that was a brief stint at O'Malveny and Myers. Which again um, was a lovely place. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Uh, it's, it's remarkable to hear descriptions of people's careers and uh, the advice they give. Um, let me, uh, Shauna said that you feel like when you send out your resume, it just goes into this black hole. Uh, what she didn't know is when you get to be about 55, they show you that there actually is a black hole that they throw all this uh, stuff into. So it's not, it's, not a, uh, it's not a dream. Uh, uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Morris from uh, Golden Gate. Kathleen. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm so honored to be on this panel with these wonderful women and token useless white male. I have to say this is definitely the first time I've ever been on a panel where someone was described as the token white male. <laughs> So I feel like that's actually kind of a big moment. I've done it many times. <laughs> um, so I'm always excited to see an ACS panel about what um, we can accomplish over time. And by we, I mean progressive law students, progressive uh, lawyers, um, law professors, uh, policymakers, if we start to really refocus the, our energy 
on the state and local level. Um, I want to mention uh, just briefly because there, there's another project going on um, at this event this weekend. It's called ALICE. And it's a wonderful project that's gathering progressive state and local legislation. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about it, you can come to a happy hour today uh, at 5.30, PJ Clark's across the street. Or, or tomorrow there's an event at, uh, at, at ACS uh, at 5.30 in the evening. Um, so just to let, let you know about that. So, you know, for sure it's... It, it's but you a can't go until 5.30. Right. right. You have to stay here. That's now. right. That's right. I get the first drink. That's the only rule. Um, so, so we're here because there's a really tough job market, right? And we want to sort of hear more about uh, what you might be able to find in the public sector. And this crisis is no fun. Let's face it, if we could have a different situation, we would. But it does potential, it does create the potential for us um, that it might trigger more creative and innovative and entrepreneurial kind of thinking among progressives about what kind of legal jobs we'd like to see added to the overall picture of lawyering in this country um, to move the progressive agenda forward. And now how does moving America in a progressive direction relate to a panel about jobs in the public sector? In my view, the two topics are related because rather than just focusing on how we can help ACS members find uh, existing jobs, we should be thinking about what kinds of new jobs we can figure out how to create in the public sector and then put our people into them. The reason why I think this should be a central focus um, is that we really need to address over the next generation or two. The frightening uh, public sector versus private sector structural imbalance in this country. Now, what do I mean by that? The nation's for-profit institutions like banks and large corporations are supposed to make money, for sure. But they're, but they're supposed to do it while serving society by creating jobs and other paths to economic security. But in recent decades, the larger industries, the larger players in the private sector have failed the public in spectacular ways. And it's really hard to punish those institutions after the fact in a way that really discourages them from flouting the law for profit in the future. So our checks are not working. Meanwhile, our nation's public institutions are nowhere near strong enough, nowhere near nimble enough to provide a healthy counterbalance to our nation's private institutions. What I mean is they're not currently capable of overseeing the private sector on an ongoing basis in a way that makes sure that unlawful and harmful business practices across a multitude of industries get nipped in the bud before they can, for example, take down the entire economy. This imbalance between private and public institutions in our country is one of the major threats to good governance. It is one of the major threats to a healthy democracy. We see this dynamic playing out all over the place. We see it in environmental ca catastrophes that result from uh, failures in regulatory oversight, like, for example, the oil spill in the Gulf a few years back. We see it in energy and workplace catastrophes, um, like the gas pipeline explosion in Northern California a few years back, took out a whole neighborhood. That was a regulatory failure. And the recent explosion in Texas, also apparently a regulatory failure. And we see it most obviously in financial catastrophes, like the meltdown that the entire world witnessed of the financial and housing sectors in, in 2008. We've seen some movement in a good direction. People who caught on to this imbalance between public and private have fueled some really terrific new developments, like the Occupy Wall Street movement and the rise of the great Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> movement? Yeah. I mean, she is a movement. <laughs> She's a human movement. She's a human. Um, 
and the establishment of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is another really wonderful development. I want to focus on consumer protection in particular today as an area uh, because I think it provides a really good example of how much possibility there really is right now to simultaneously grow and strengthen the public sector, push the public sector in a progressive direction, and create legal jobs for you people all at the same time. Um, I, and if you, I have, uh, this, a lot of this talk is based on, uh, or comes out of, um, an article that I wrote that's coming out in the Fordham Urban Law Journal um, in the fall. So just if you want to find out more information, more detailed information about the laws that I'm going to be talking about, that's where you can find them. In recent years, it's become pretty clear that our consumer protection regime is broken in the sense that corporations can get away with doing pretty much anything they want without the fear of being held accountable. Why is that? Is there no law to stop them? There is. There is. As it turns out, we actually have a lot of really good, really broad consumer protection laws on the books in this country. Every single state and the federal government have enacted laws that prohibit corporations very broadly from engaging in unlawful conduct that harms consumers or the economy. That captures everything imaginable. It captures every industry, it captures it's a catch-all kind of law. The FTC Act, it's called. That's the federal version. And then the state versions are usually called little, little FTC Acts. So what's the problem? The problem is we don't have nearly enough lawyers enforcing these laws. And we absolutely need public lawyers at all levels of government, federal, state, and local, to join in this effort if it's going to be effective. Nonprofits and plaintiff's lawyers can't begin to keep up with the extent of unlawful corporate behavior and legal barriers have arisen in the last 20 years or so that, put, that, that prevent them from doing so effectively. That's also in the article. I'm not going to get into the legal stuff today. And it shouldn't be all on private and nonprofit shoulders anyway to enforce the law just because it's civil law, right? We have some really terrific attorney general's offices at the state level that are pursuing consumer cases with great passion and skill. But they tend to focus on practices, understandably, that are harming the entire state. And they face different political pressures than local government offices do. And even if they wanted to, they just can't get to everything. There's just too much corporate malfeasance going on unchecked for the current enforcement regimes combined to deal with it. What we need and what I believe we in this room must create is a more robust cadre of local public lawyers focused on the problem of consumer protection enforcement. Right now, most cities and counties in this country don't have standing to enforce the 51 great consumer protection statutes that we have. What that means as a practical matter is that even though quite often city and county actors, city and county elected officials, local people are the first to notice problems being caused by a particular unlawful behavior, they can't do a thing about it. They can't do a thing about it. Instead, consumers who are affected by the behavior have to see if they can find a lawyer, have to uh, or have to wait until the damage is bad enough that it actually gets the attention of the, of the state attorney general or of the federal authorities. But by then, the problem might be large enough that it's done irreparable damage to individuals, to the economy, et cetera. What if cities and counties did have standing to enforce consumer protection legislation? This would mean they could seek injunctions to stop illegal acts by the private sector. That's good policy. It also opens up the possibility for creating consumer protection units inside of city and county council's offices from sea to shining sea. This is already being done in some places. San Francisco in particular provides a great model. Um, in California, some cities can enforce uh, California's broad-based consumer protection statute. At the San Francisco City Attorney's Office, where I had the great privilege to work for almost a decade before I went into academia, 
City Attorney Dennis Herrera has successfully brought a number of cases that have stopped unlawful and fraudulent practices by banks and other corporations at the early stages. To describe just a few cases, in the last few years, San Francisco stopped payday lending companies from illegally charging working poor families 446% interest on installment loans in violation of state law. San Francisco stopped a major bank and a partner, a major arbitration company, from colluding to fix thousands and thousands and thousands of credit card disputes between the bank and its customers. Most recently, City Attorney Dennis Herrera has taken on the makers of energy drinks for using ads that are false and that target children. One local paper has described this particular case as Dennis versus Goliath. <laughs> I don't like Goliath's chances, actually. Now, you might be asking, how has San Francisco paid for these cases? Here's the beauty of it. These cases pay for themselves. Thanks to penalty provisions in the Consumer Protection Statute, San Francisco has been able to stop corporate malfeasance and at the same time actually expand and strengthen its efforts to take on bad corporate actors. In essence, the city attorney has created a self-funding public interest law firm inside a local public law office. Now, not by accident, this San Francisco project and the cases uh, that I described were developed and prosecuted by active members of the American Constitution Society who went into those jobs. Um, Dennis is on the board, on the national board of, of the ACS, um, and the leaders at the beginning uh, were not only myself and Heather Gerken, um, who, uh, who I'll mention in a second, um, but also Ann O'Leary, who's very well known at ACS, um, and Owen Clements, who's actually here today, um, who's an active member of ACS, and others. Um, in addition to that, uh, because we, we created a collaboration with Yale Law School, um, I met Heather Gerken at the ACS convention seven years ago, and we struck, struck up a conversation, and over the summer we put together a project where Yale Law students were helping vet potential public interest cases for San Francisco for credit, and we got Berkeley involved uh, soon thereafter, right? So we have students coming through and getting this really incredible training and also serving um, local public law offices. So the cases have also gotten support from the ACS chapter at Yale, um, I think that ACS can and should be very proud that its members' fingerprints are all over this innovative public law model. No accident. Now here we all are. Imagine what we could do as a group if all of our larger cities and counties, let's just say those over 100,000 people, had standing to enforce the nation's consumer protection laws just for injunctive relief and penalties. If we took this step over time, we could create almost 300 self-funding public interest law firms located inside city and county council's offices enforcing our consumer laws. This wouldn't be a panacea, of course. No matter what we do, there will always be corporations that get away with making money by breaking laws, just as there will always be people who get away with crimes. But it would be a step in the right direction in terms of creating jobs for progressive lawyers, while at the same time working towards a better private sector, public sector balance. In general, I feel like we need to really challenge ourselves all the time to situate every discussion we have within a broader discussion of how to move this country in a progressive and healthy direction. We've got to do this kind of long-term institutional thinking, even those of you still in law school, even those recent grads, We've got to get used to doing this kind of deep institutional, kind of 20-year, 30-year, 40-year thinking. Why? Because this is the kind of thinking corporations do. This is the kind of thinking that the Federalist Society does. So I want to make a call out to law schools in particular. I believe that every single law school in this country, but certainly the public law schools, should have a state and local government law professor teaching that class so that students are learning what they need to know. I feel like, I, I believe that every single law school in this country should have a state and local government law clinic through which students can serve their state or serve their local government. I feel as though government jobs, that there should be a kind of natural intuitive path, let's say 20 years from now, 
from law school into government jobs, the way that right now there's a natural intuitive path from law school into corporate jobs. We've got to set up that infrastructure. We've got to set up that pipeline. That's how we take over. The call to law students is, don't just think about how to get a good job or even a good public sector job. Think about how to create jobs. Get you know, three, four, five of your friends and a city you love. And think about how to basically pitch the creation of jobs um, that over time will actually help that local public entity. We need to focus on, on creating over time hundreds or thousands of jobs that will help bring our private and public institutions into a better balance. Cool. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kathleen. Uh, Heather Gherkin is an old friend of mine, and she wanted me to announce that she's going to be just outside uh, after this is over if anybody would like a job or an internship uh, or her to set up a particular uh, litigation project. She, she'll be waiting um, right out here. Yeah, my story is that she was all over me. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda. Thank you, and I'm, I'm so pleased to be here today. You know, our title of our panel is A Call to Public Service. I think we just got a great call here. Um, and when I think of call and calling, um, I have long thought of uh, trying to live my life with a vocation and not uh, just a career. And I share with you, you have probably heard this before, uh, but from a great thinker, uh, Frederick Beekner, who defined vocation as the intersection of where your deepest passion and the world's deepest hunger meet. And so um, I'll, I want to tell you what my story is here today and kind of how I've tried to have that thought of vocation animate um, what has looked maybe like a little bit of a, a wandering path of a career to this point. Uh, I started law school at the University of Texas in 2001, um, and that happened to be the first year that ACS franchised um, to law schools across the country. Uh, and I read in my school newspaper, uh, before I even started class, that there was this great new organization for progressive law students. And I sought out the professor and said, I want to be involved. Um, so I was on the board of my ACS uh, student chapter from my first year um, at UT Law. And that really was um, one of the best moves I made for my career. And you'll see as I tell my story today how that has kind of followed um, throughout. Uh, in fact, the president of the first president of the UT uh, ACS um, chapter told me uh, during my first semester of law school of this amazing um, law firm, plaintiff's law firm called Barron and Bud in Dallas, Texas, um, which is a large uh, consumer-oriented um, law firm that did a lot of toxic torts litigation. So I decided for my first year I wanted to work at Barron and Bud, and Fred Barron, the founder of that firm, was one of the founders of ACS. So you can see how this is all uh, linking together already. Uh, so when I graduated in 2004 um, from from law school, I went straight to Barron and Bud. And looking today, you know, nine years since I graduated from law school, it's perfectly half. I spent half of my career in a more um, traditional legal environment and now half in a more public service environment. Um, so I worked at Barron and Bud for two years and about a year into it I decided I really wanted the experience of a federal clerkship, um, which I had not done. So somewhat unconventionally I went ahead and applied for a federal clerkship um, and was really fortunate to clerk for a fabulous federal court judge in Dallas, Texas named Barbara Lynn uh, for a year. And then after that, I instead of going back to Barron and Bud, there have been a lot of changes at the firm, I uh, went and worked for a commercial litigation boutique in Dallas for about a year and a half. Um, that was not my vocation, I realized pretty quickly in. Um, it was great experience, fabulous lawyers, um, but I was not feeling uh, my deepest passion uh, billing hours at that firm. Um, so I decided it was time to, to really make the move to public service. and. I, um, and so I uh, came up to Washington, actually, my, uh, my 
then boyfriend, now husband, and I thought we really wanted to move to Washington. So I came up, had some informational interviews, even on the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, and uh, that Fred Barron helped set up for me. Um, and I just wandered past the office of Congressman Lloyd Doggett, um, who I had interned for um, back when I was in high school. Um, so this has been a long, long time coming, but nothing I suspect at the time. And I just said, you know, I think I'm interested in working at a committee. You know, uh, if you hear of anything, if you all could let me know. No. Um, and, you know, they called me, oh, you know, we don't have any openings now. Um, and uh, about two weeks later after that conversation, you know, I had gone on, go, gone back to Dallas, thought maybe this isn't the right time. They called and said, I know you were looking at Washington, but would you be interested in moving to Austin and being our district director? <laughs> I thought, this is really, you know, out of left field. But uh, another quote of uh, Beekner's that I really like is listening to your life. And I thought, you know, people don't often call you out of the blue with a job offer. So I thought maybe, I don't know where this is going, but sure, why not? So, um, so I moved back to Austin, which is my hometown. And if you've been to Austin, that's not a hard sell. Um, <laughs> and so I went there and spent four years um, being the district director for Congressman Lloyd Doggett, which was a fabulous opportunity um, and, and really got uh, to serve the people there um, with him. And then um, we, did, my husband and I said, remember, we were really wanting to live in Washington. So uh, last November, we moved up here. And it just so happened that the opening they had in the office was to be the Ways and Means Council. Um, if I'd known I was going to be Ways and Means Council for Congressman Doggett, I might have taken a few less constitutional law courses in law school and a few more uh, tax law courses, but um, but it's uh, but you know it's it's really been a fabulous opportunity um, and something that I don't think I ever would have um, had the opportunity to have had I not taken um, the path that I did. So, I, just to tell that story, these are maybe four lessons that I've gleaned from from my path to public service um, that might be helpful to you. Um, first is get involved, no matter what, where you are, what um, place you are in your in school or in your legal career, and what really interests you. Um, obviously, you like me were interested in ACS, um, and so you know I was not only a student chapter leader, but uh, led the lawyers chapter in Dallas. Um, so I stayed involved even when I was working in the private sector with ACS, and that really served me very well. It doesn't. You know, ACS is wonderful, obviously you're already involved, but other things that you're interested in, it really shows that true believer, you know, thing on your resume, that you don't have to be working full time. It can be something volunteer, but it will make you stand out if and when you decide to make the jump to public service. Um, it's also come out in interesting ways. I think it was my second or third week on the job with Congressman Doggett. He sent me an email. He was up here in Washington. I was in the district, and he had been to a dinner party where the executive director of ACS was, a small dinner party. And I don't know if, who was the executive director at the time, but he said, you know, she mentioned that, that I had, you know, been so active in ACS. And he said, oh, I was so proud. Um, so, you know, you just never know when that's going to come up. The other is um, one of the speakers that I brought to the Dallas lawyer chapter um, is a woman named Melanie Sloan that works for Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. And uh, just in the past few weeks, our office has been talking and working with her more. So I said, do you remember when I brought you to ACS Dallas? She said, oh, yeah, of course. So, so these uh, progressive law circles can be very small, and you could be meeting people doing your ACS work that, um, that will help you in your career to come. Um, second, uh, be ready and willing to take back a step back in salary if you decide to go to do something more traditional legal work before you go to public service. I think you've heard that theme here. I, when I left the law firm to go work with Congressman Doggett, it was more than a 50% pay cut. So, you know, I, some people did not understand that, but I understood it, and it's um, it's really, of course, has been so much more rewarding than any paycheck ever could have been um, working, uh, doing the work that I have been doing. So it's not something that I ever regretted, but you've got to be ready to do that. But also look for, you know, innovative ways that might make that cut a little easier. Um, a lot of government programs have wonderful loan forgiveness programs that I'm sure you know about. So there, there are ways to make that um, seem a little bit easier. Um, 
third, you know, watch out for the unexpected. I told my story about how I got my job with Congressman Doggett. You know, it, it, so, you know, look out for things that might not be exactly what you were looking for, but it might provide the path to something that you like working at the Ways and Means Committee that I could never have imagined I would have enjoyed as much as I do. Um, and finally, you know, when you do go to work for a cause, or in my case it's been a person, you know, find great role models and people that you truly believe in. You know, I've been fortunate, I think, to have three truly exceptional people that I've worked for in Fred Barron, Judge Barbara Lynn, and Lloyd Doggett. And to have three people who have had their lives, such incredible lives in public service, has really informed um, my path as well. So, thank you so much. Thanks very much, Amanda. It's great to hear all that description of all that uh, justice being meted out in Dallas, Texas. Um, I grew up in Mesquite, Texas, and I didn't know there was any justice to be had in Dallas. Uh, and earlier in life, uh, one of my good fortunes was to be friends with uh, Molly Ivins and Ann Richards and still Jim Hightower. And it's their view that there's no justice to be had in Dallas, Texas either. So uh, it's, 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 you've done very well. You've there's, a very well. Right? there's a lot of justice <laughs> yeah, to be done. There's a lot of justice We're learning uh, uh, big justice tasks in North Carolina right now. Uh, we're now to the point where you get to ask questions. And so there's a microphone right up here. Uh, it is important not to be bashful to sort of rush that microphone and get just uh, get in line uh, to speak up and uh, direct a word or two to these uh, panelists. Yeah. Uh, I don't want this to be like my constitutional law class, and I don't want to have to call on anyone. So uh, <laughs> proceed to the front. As, as we're doing that, I will um, ask a question to sort of ease this awkward uh, transition. Uh, Kathleen uh, uh, did a lot. Uh, on something which is of interest, I think, for in this panel and uh, sort of for you, and that is highlighting uh, local, state and local um, opportunities and possibilities and maybe even unfolding structures that uh, you would not have reason to think about. Um, but it occurred to me that uh, others of our panel likely have uh, suggestions uh, on that front as well. Sean has done some uh, now, Representative uh, uh, Duran, uh, the same, and I think Amanda. So let me just ask if you have any um, sort of th local opportunities that you'd like to focus on for the audience. Sure. Um, so in terms of local opportunities in ter of jobs and those types mm -hmm. of things, um, yes, absolutely. And one thing that I think that was mentioned that, because um, you've re heard a perspective of what it's like to try and find employment in Washington, D.C. Um, but I think also something that is so important to not um, forget is to really look at, for opportunities at the city level, the county level. There's a variety of different positions that are sometimes available to people in the public service arena that are not necessarily working in Washington, D.C., and can be, you can be very effective in those roles as well. Um, and then just to follow up a little bit on this whole idea of creating jobs and creating jobs um, with individuals with backgrounds that really want to get into public service. You know, in the state of Colorado right now, there are so many individuals who are going into court without any sort of attorney. And this next year at the state legislative level, that's something that we're really going to look at is if, if there's ways that we can build stronger associations so that more people can have access to legal services. And I'm actually, I'm very much interested in um, following up with some of the some of the work that's been being done in other areas around consumer protection. Um, I do think that there's an opportunity to start coming up with our own processes, building our own teams to be able to um, increase access to, to legal services. And I just want to highlight one of the beauties of working at the local level. Um, so in D.C., I think sometimes it's possible to feel a little bit fungible. Like if you, I, I knew, for instance, that if I left the Senate Judiciary Committee, that there would be hundreds of people who were probably far more qualified than I was who would be eager to take that job. And one of the really neat things about moving to a smaller community is that you, 
it, you don't necessarily know that. There's a chance that if you, you know, that, that you can make an impact that if you weren't there, maybe somebody else wouldn't do. That's just the beauty of, there's, there's not as many kind of like-minded progressive people who are out there wanting to do the exact same thing. So there's such value in, in moving to a place and, and thinking, wow, I'm, I'm making an impact in it. If I weren't here, that impact may not be made. That's a really, really neat feeling. Sure, and I'll just add, you know, having worked as a district director, um, I think that's absolutely true, and there are 435 <laughs> members of Congress who have 435 districts, and if you have an interest and, and know someone that I think those are wonderful jobs to have, it also gives you a sense if you do have um, interest in running for office yourself, um, you really get to know those communities uh, very well and think it, I think that's also a great pathway to public service. Great. Thank you. So let's start with the questions. Uh, you can direct it either to a particular panelist or the whole group. I just would ask that it be of relatively modest duration and it end with an interrogatory. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and introduce yourself, if you I'll would. I'll try please. my best. Is this on? Yes, it sounds like it. My name is Harry. I have a question specifically for Ms. Morris. You talked about forming um, organizations within government that have the standing to pursue civil litigation. Mm -hmm. how, do you how do you protect those types of jobs from uh, the political process? How do you make sure, number one, that there isn't manipulation through funding, even though you said that it would be self-funding? Mm -hmm. And how do you ensure that the right people get those placements? Um, great questions. So there's no way to completely protect these kinds of jobs from politics because of Citizens United. So that's a problem. <laughs> We're gonna have to fix that one. Um, but I will say this. I will say that, um, that the kinds of people that end up in these jobs are the kinds of people who gravitate towards them, for starters. Um, there aren't a lot of consumer protection jobs that are you know, designed where you go after the consumer uh, as opposed to a you know, corporate actor. And then the third thing that I will say is that the work is inherently political. What do I mean by that? It's an elected law office. It means that the cases that you pursue will be cases that your constituents will probably be okay with, which means that the docket in San Francisco will not look like Atlanta's docket, will not look like Dallas's docket, will not look like, you know, so it will be driven by politics in that sense um, if we're talking about money in politics, I don't, want to be, I don't want to be naive about this because it does cost a lot of money to run for office, but it costs less money to run for local office than it does to run for statewide or national office. Because you can, the thing about the local level is that you could actually get elected to a lot of local positions still by like knocking on doors, you know? So there's a way in which, especially after Citizens United, the purest form of democracy possible until we sort of fix that is going to be at a level where you can substitute something else for money in terms of reaching people with your message. So um, those are the best answers that I have to those questions. Okay, that Thank is you, fine. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Katie. I'm a law student. And I really appreciated how Amanda spoke to her fortunate um, participation in the ACS and how that opened doors for you. And a bunch of you spoke with sponsors. And I wanted to know if you had any other advice to give for those of us who may not have sponsors or those people who know the right people to help us get where we want to be yet, uh, especially as one now. Thank you so much. I think that's one of the most frustrating parts of trying to find a public service job. Is you, you sometimes you think, oh, you have to just know the right people. And, and I don't know the right people. I'm not, my family wasn't active in politics or we're not big donors. Or, but the cool thing about getting a, a sponsor is that it's something that you can really do for yourself just by tr starting to get some of that true believer experience. And, and so I think my best advice would be just show up someplace with a cause that makes sense to you and start, and, and it, it can be for a few hours a week and it does not have to be paid, but just start doing something that you believe in. And, and if you believe in it, you'll be doing a great job at it. And then the people that you're working with will, will start to understand that, that you get it. But so I, I think the best way to, find somebody who can help you is just go to those places where they are, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and I think just get in, getting involved, it, it's probably going to not be for pay, whatever you're doing is in the public's interest, you know, but um, getting, you know, my law school, I 
I never sat still and had a different internship or clerkship or something throughout school. And I think that helps show kind of that that real interest in both plaintiff's law and the public service. So, and once you show up and do a good job, you'll have a sponsor when you leave that job. Let me just go put a little exclamation point on what uh, Shauna said, that because it can be very frustrating to think, you know, I don't know anybody. I didn't come from a, a family of this kind of lineage and the like. Uh, but you can build that by marrying, and this was the, yeah. <laughs> that's a really good way to do it, that's like, uh, by marrying the passion uh, that you feel over these powerful issues uh, with the life you lead. Uh, can, and can we gay marry the passion that yeah, we feel? Yeah, that's right, that's right. This can be done uh, sort of from any, sure was... any perspective. Um, the, the, uh, the, a lot of the career paths that folks have described involved at least some uh, departure from traditional avenues into arenas that uh, they thought, I certainly feel this way, that, that uh, moved you immensely. That uh, you thought, well, I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know how much money I'm going to make. But I love the idea, or in fact, I demand the idea of working on something which moves my heart. And the reason for that is that you've, you know, there, there are a lot of different ways to do legal work, but you've only got one life. And so you only have this one to spend. Uh, and if you can spend it, in an endeavor which you believe, it doesn't have to be the same for everyone, but which you believe is changing the world in the way that you believe it ought to be changed, then it, it sort of alters everything. Uh, and I think you find, too, in the longer course, well, lo and behold, you get pretty good at it. Uh, you, you tend to be very good after a long time in working at things that you care more about than anything else. And so that can be slow and sort of frustrating, but it's actually not, in my view, ultimately dependent on who you know or sort of what the, uh, the traditional mentorship route is. So, yes, ma'am. Hi. Thank you, all of you, for your wonderful comments. I learned a lot. My name is Amanda Kneef. I'm the Managing Director of American Atheists. And we do a lot of active advocacy around the country. And one of the issues that we find is that there are a lot of citizen legislators who are not well versed in progressive issues. Um, they have their own issues from their own hometown. And from being from Iowa, I used to work for the legislative uh, council's office and I wrote legislation for my uh, citizen legislators. Um, and I know how little time they had to learn the issues mm -hmm. that they were faced with for the four months that they came to Des Moines and learned. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's opportunities to get state legislators to give themselves some help so that we can get progressive lawyers to have jobs at the state level, much like you were talking about, Ms. Morris, um, so that we have an opportunity to teach them when they come and do their work, uh, much like we have built-in staffs um, at the federal level. Thank you. And I'll go ahead and respond to that. Um, I, it is a world of difference uh, working at the state legislature ver versus being a congresswoman or a congressman in D.C. Um, the staff that you have is very limited, and this goes back to the last question that was asked as well. You would be surprised if you just ask how many opportunities are out there to get involved with public service at the local or state level. Um, I know at least at the state Colorado legislative capital, there are so many interns um, that we rely on to give us information and give us information that is going to be unbiased um, because many times a lot of elected officials rely heavily on the lobbyists that are working on a particular issue and with turnover rates and um, uh, you know different things I think happen th through the legislative process. There's a lot of legislators who are there for a short period of time. The most you could serve is eight years and many times it's the lobbyists who know more information about the history of different p issues that are coming before you. And so there is a lot of opportunity um, I think to work directly for legislators or city council persons or 
to get involved with sort of outside organizations, labor organizations, pro-choice organizations, environmental organizations, um, you know, work with a nonprofit that has credibility that has been able to successfully pass legislation in the past, I think to build those connections, um, but then also to continue to have an avenue uh, for different types of experience that you could use later when you're applying for, for jobs. Let me just add to sort of ratify your dual sense that legislators don't always have a full <laughs> cognizance of the Constitution and your work on religious freedom. Uh, we have a group of legislators in North Carolina who just introduced a bill about two months ago to establish Christianity as uh, North Carolina's official religion. So I wanted to invite you to come Finally. down and meet with them. That's it. Finally! <laughs> So I, I wanted to mention that uh, as a re uh, uh, Alice, which I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, is exactly this. It's a resource. It's a database of pro progressive, existing progressive legislation that can pr provide a model at the state level, at the local level. So if you're interested in legislative stuff, which is totally great and very needed, um, come to the Alice events. Yes, Good afternoon. I'm Rebecca Rogers with Brown, Goldstein, and Levy in Baltimore. And my question builds upon the discussion of gaining true believer experience and the acknowledgement that such experience will likely not pay money. I have been, I, I have been deterred at some times, both in college and in law school, from pursuing public service because of, because of knowing that I do need to bring in money. So I got there eventually, but there were more obstacles along yeah. the way. So what are your thoughts on building pathways to public service for those students who cannot afford to go unpaid for an entire summer? Thank you. Uh, I, that's a great question. And I, I remember feeling very lucky that I was able, um, my, one of my summers in college, to take the unpaid White House internship because it opened a bunch of doors. but. Yes, that's definitely not an option for a lot of people. And one of the things I would say is remember that your true believer experience doesn't have to be your full-time job. So you could arguably go do a job that paid and then a couple hours a week go do something kind of true believer-ish that, that just all you need is a couple bullet points on your resume, right? And you can create a couple bullet points on your resume with five hours a week. It doesn't have to be 40. Um, but beyond that, there are some um, true believer jobs that, that do pay. I, I was a law clerk at the Human Rights Campaign. Um, for a semester, and, and that pays. And I mean, it's not going to make you rich, but it was, it, it paid something. Um, and then I also was a law clerk at a plaintiff's law firm, and I remember at the time it paid $30 an hour, and I was in law school, and I was like, I am so, so rich. <laughs> uh, and so, I mean, th I guess my point is, you know, th there are there are some yeah. places that pay, um, and, and otherwise just do a few hours at a time. So I, everybody always thinks that, that the way they did it is the best, and, and the way that I did it is the best. So <laughs> this is what I did. So I felt like I, I wasn't going to feel powerful as a progressive kind of person in the world if I had a lot of debt. So I went to the most high paid, I did sort of public interest stuff in law school. Um, and then I ended up, after like a couple years after law school, realizing this, this problem that I felt like a sort of like a weak kind of suffering person doing public interest work. And I was like, this is no good. This is no good um, for me or for whatever cause I'm working on. And I went and got the highest paid job that I could. And I stripped all of my needs back. Like we basically lived like students, my wife and I again, and wiped out my debt in two years. And then I started over. But the thing about it is, is that that meant that by the time I was, I think I started over at like 33 or 34. So it wasn't, it wasn't like, terribly old. But for me, you know, I really needed to like get rid of that debt, you know. And I do want to really, really um, say how important it is that um, what you were talking about, about sort of following your passions. You know, I remember having a conversation with a law firm partner in my early 30s where he just said, I don't understand how you could even be contemplating leading. You're do leaving. You're doing so beautifully here. If you put your head down and stay 10 more years, <laughs> You know, if you put your head down for 10 years, you'll be 42, and you'll have the world by a string. You'll be able to do whatever you want. And I said, I know that, and I get that that's attractive, but I don't know how to put a price on my 30s. 
So this goes to this idea that you only are 32 once and 33 once and 34 once, and that's real. <laughs> And I just want to add to that, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I feel like the time I spent, again, at the plaintiff's firm, that that was a kind of public service. And so, and that paid very well. It paid what I'm making right now. Um, and so I, you know, I felt like that, so there are paying jobs that you can get this. Yeah. And then also, you know, another, and so, you know, I think don't, and someone at that firm told me, something like people who think like us also need to have some money. So, you know, yes. so you know, it to give just to give to cause to either have stability. a sense of stability and to give to causes yes. that we believe in. And there are ways to if if you decide that for whatever reason that you wanted to go to a, a more traditional legal environment but you still have this call for public service, you can seek out things like you know, I worked on some pro bono briefing when I was at the law firm and some other things that give you the true believer experience that feeds your soul in maybe a way that your um, day job doesn't feed your soul um, always and, um, and can tide you over until you're at a point that you might want to make a departure. Great. Yes, sir. Um, hi, my name is Steve Fawcett, and I'm a law student at SMU which makes me kind of familiar with the situation in Dallas. Dallas. <laughs> yeah, everyone's talking about Dallas. But, um, but anyways, um, this summer I've been working with the city of McAllen's attorney's office, mm -hmm. and uh, which you know, brings up a lot of questions. Um, so I have my questions for uh, Ms. Morris, but anybody can uh, chime in. Uh, one thing I've noticed, at least with the city of McAllen, which is in southern Texas, is uh, ver the mentality is very much, and nothing wrong with this, but we spend a lot of our time trying to make deals happen. So trying a lot to make of Deals happen. Deals Try, happen. Yeah, we're trying to get yeah. at every city, like you know, like anybody is. We're trying to get people to come to our city. We're trying yes. to get companies, industry, locate here, start your life here, you know, be here. Cause that's how cities grow and thrive. But with that comes the mentality of we're essentially salespeople, and we're trying to sell our city for whomever. Right. So how do you balance that with the? Oh, now we also need to regulate. And I agree with that. I think it would be wonderful if. Um, local governments and city governments, you know, have consumer protection. But if I'm an industry, I'm saying, well, so you want me to come here, but you're also going to. So how do you, I guess, find that balance and how do you change that culture uh, within uh, local and city governments? Thank you. Sure. I think that as a public official, you definitely need to bring cases that, if they're not brought, not only disrupt the lives of people who are being ripped off, but also disrupt the market. So the po there's a point to be made here, which is that if one, if two banks in San Francisco, payday lending companies, Check and Go and Money Mart, are charging 446% interest on payday on, on installment loans, and the other banks aren't, because it is in fact illegal to do that, then they have an then they have an unfair advantage in the marketplace. So I think what's important is understanding is is basically bringing cases not on the margins to be flashy, like you need good people, like the people in this room in that city attorney's job to pick the cases, because prosecutorial discretion is everything, and you've really got to exercise it. You want to bring the cases, I, I mean, you want, I think you want to bring the cases where there are, there are a lot of people really getting hurt, it's disrupting, and it may also be disrupting you know, business or the economy because it's tilting essentially the playing field. We need to really start to reframe this regulation business. You know, regulation is there for business, too. It's there for business. Unlawful business practices are bad for business, right? No one, it, very rarely is that talked about. Um, and I think it would be helpful to start talking about it that way. But I do think your docket would look very different. I mean, look, one of the big constituents in the payday lending case that I mentioned earlier were military families. So that was important to us, you know, that California military families were getting ripped off. That is a case that you could bring in Texas. I would hope to God if military families were being charged 446% interest and if that rate was against the law, I would hope to God you could bring an injunction case in Texas. If you can't, you need to just leave. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Steve, let me... Um, I, I've been to San Francisco, California, and I've been to McAllen, Texas. And let me just say that we could take judicial notice that there's a modestly different political culture in those two places. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm Keith West. 
The public interest uh, self-sustaining model that Professor Morris described in San Francisco, I thought was very interesting. Do you know of efforts to create similar programs elsewhere? And then also, what is the, uh, the sort of resistance that you can expect to attempts to create such models? So I wrote a little essay about this <laughs> um, So if, uh, that, that sort of um, answers some of these questions a little bit more deeply. But So the essay is called uh, The Rising Culture of Engagement in Local Public Law Offices. And it makes the point that there's a cultural resistance to at city attorney's offices and county council's offices in some places to doing this work because they don't really see it as their job. Or put another way, you know, the, the question that it, that, that it was put to me by the, par the same partner who I was talking to before, after I started doing this work, leaned back in his chair, he's a Texan, and he said, shouldn't you be paving roads? <laughs> So I, I feel like um, partly what's going on is um, there, the answer is there are other cities that are doing it. Los Angeles has done some of this. Chicago has done some of this. Uh, Baltimore has done some of this. Certainly New York Corporations Council has a major unit that does this. Um, uh, but to the extent that it's not being done, people feel like, oh, it's too expensive. It's not our area of expertise. It's not the sort of thing that we do. So partly why I left practice and went into academia is because I would like to have a conversation with all of you and with local government scholars and with local public law offices about what it is that we think our cities and counties should be doing if it's not enforcing the laws that we need to have enforced in order to, in order to basically just live our lives, right? I think that we need to have a conversation about what public lawyering should look like and what kinds of things that public lawyers get involved with. Um, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Angelina, and I am a judge advocate, actually. I'm probably in the minority. I'm going to take a wild guess. Mm -hmm. um, but your military comment actually has prompted a question that's been going on my in my head, and maybe this sounds too direct, but what are, what are, what are we really doing to leverage that sort of population where we have this population that has sympathy from both sides. Right. You can go in and say, we need to help service members and their families, and you're not going to see somebody on the other side of the aisle going, oh, no, that's a bad idea. Um, we have a ton of consumer protection laws that exist for the military, and yet they're just sitting there. We have fee shifting. We have fee, I mean, uh, the Service Member Civil Relief Act allows for fee shifting, and yet mm -hmm. we see this big hole of no one stepping forward. and. It, there's a hole that can be filled, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of infrastructure pieces that can come in and fill it that already exist. And how are we getting the message out that, hey, we already have it. We just need people to step up. What are, what, what's your name? Angelina. You just stepped up. <laughs> Yay. This is what it looks like when you add value. You step up and you say, there's this thing out there that no one's doing. How are, how are we going to like get paid to do it? Or how can we basically figure out how to do more of it? For all I know, I mean, I, there must be, I mean, I don't know, there must be, there are organizations that serve military families. Are they connected to lawyers, right? I mean, if I were a politician hoping to run for higher office in a jurisdiction with lots and lots of military families, I would be very interested in having conversations with nonprofits that serve military families about how the local public law office could serve their interests by making sure that they're not being ripped off, right? So it's basically getting the light bulb to come on in elected officials' minds that there's a connection between electability and getting something done. So let's talk afterwards. Absolutely. Angelina, it's, this is a little bit of an important lesson too on how crucial these issues are, how powerful uh, one's adversaries are on this front, because I would think, as you do, that uh, rallying around veterans would uh, lead to terrific uh, political uh, success. Uh, but in North Carolina, where we're facing uh, a sort of uh, extremely unpleasant tide uh, in the State House, uh, we got a great military leadership to testify uh, against a renewed payday lending bill. They were uniform in their opposition in very strong uh, military uh, towns and communities, uh, and yet an ideologically bent legislature ignored them, something that I never thought uh, would happen, happen, commanding officers. 
Uh, I've just spent a lot of time in the last few weeks in Fayetteville, North Carolina, which is a huge uh, military town in which right now there are 400 veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan, homeless, living under the bridges uh, in Fayetteville. Uh, the uh, Fayetteville just uh, last year spent $4.5 million for an animal shelter, but they will not do anything for over 1,700 people homeless uh, in Fayetteville. So the work of justice go uh, now. is be there. hugely threatened and powerful and at the core of what uh, the American experience is. And I think we shouldn't uh, sort of have illusions about that as we talk about uh, the possibilities of the future. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Hi, I'm Jean Zaharia Shevitz. I'm with the Public Justice Center in Baltimore. Um, Representative Duran, I was really interested in what you said about the upcoming legislative session and trying to get more lawyers for people in courts. Um, we're very involved with trying to get a civil right to counsel in Maryland. And we actually have a task force that was just voted in this year. It's a very long process, so we'll have a task force that studies it, and then maybe they'll recommend something, and then maybe they'll pass something. Um, but I, I was wondering how, in today's economic climate, you work on those kinds of issues and how lawyers should approach them. Because the first wall is always how do we pay for that? And um, it's bad enough in the criminal system where there is a guarantee of a lawyer to get somebody, an actual competent lawyer, to do their case. Um, and so I was wondering how, how you face that when you're talking to other legislators or how you think that lawyers should work around those questions when we still are kind of reeling from what happened in 2008 and we're also in an age where nobody wants to talk about raising taxes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I'll tell you, in Colorado right now, when you think about the tax issue, I mean, when you compare the amount of state dollars that we actually spend on essential services like education, um, we're deeply underfunded. I mean, there's some estimates that we're 49th in the country in terms of our public education funding, and there's a real effort now to look at that and bring forward a ballot initiative this year to do just that and ask Coloradans to raise their own taxes um, so that we can provide essential services. So I think that that political dynamic is a uh, very real one. Um, that said, it goes back to this concept of what uh, the public's perception is of government and what government should be. And I think that, that there are many issues that we can point to, either whether it's individuals who don't have enough uh, funding to be able to hire a lawyer, and that's why we see people across the state and across the country going into courts on their own to defend themselves or uh, bring forward cases. I think that's something that we can point to. I think that there's also a lot of other uh, policy issues that we, depending on whether it is where you are and what the issues are that face that particular community, really pinpointing what those issues are and then making the case that we need to increase access um, to legal services across the board is something that is, is crucial. Um, and we heard a little bit about that from the consumer protection standpoint um, and also you know, this issue that was discussed regarding payday lenders. Um, it has been amazing to me to see in the last three years serving in the state legislature how far to the right the Republican Party has actually went. Um, because we have had several issues, issues where vets will come and testify in uh, front of the legislature regarding you know, needed services, a variety of different issues where you would think that both Republicans and Democrats would come together and be supportive of our veterans. If we can't agree on anything else, you would think that that would be an area that we would agree on. And that just hasn't happened. Um, in the day-to-day -day sort of working on these d different issues, we've seen many instances where that has not happened. Um, so I go back to, and, and, and back on that point, and that's probably why the Republican Party is having such a hard time right now with the public generally. Um, they've lost their moderate voices. They've lost the voices of individuals who have really wanted to work across the aisle and do what's right. Uh, for this country, and they've lost that. Now, whether they will be able to have the pendulum swing back at some point and we will be able to have more collaboration, um, I don't know if that is going to happen. But at the end of the day, I think it is just so important to 
always remember it's not about you. And I, this was raised <laughs> on this panel as well. It's not about you. It's about the people you represent. It's about the community. It's about what people want to see in their elected officials. It's about what people want to see from their government. And I think that there's issues that we can really focus on to bring those issues forward because, because the public gets it. Gene, as you know, there's great work which has uh, gone on for years in Maryland on questions of uh, access to civil justice. Uh, been something of a leader, at least in terms of energy on that front. But this is an important illustration of how massive the gap is in the United States between what we say and what we do. We, we carve equal justice under law on all of our courthouse walls, and yet we have nothing like a right to access to a lawyer in the civil justice system. They do in the European Union. They do in the British Commonwealth countries. They have had that for decades. We talk the most about access to justice and do the least. The uh, uh, Gates Foundation just funded the International Rule of Law study once again. And of the 20 wealthy countries in the United States, we came in last. We get the only F uh, because, and, and, and frankly, if they applied the rules well and we tried to get into the European Union, they'd have to say, no, we got to reject you because you treat poor people like hell. And, uh, and torture people. We, we, we beg or we, we claim this commitment to equal justice. And then when you look at what we actually do instead of what we say, I, I've always said the Gates study is not fair because it measures the United States based on what it does rather than what it says. And we're much more into what we say rather than uh, what we do. But it's another example of the massive departure, the sort of fundamental hypocrisy which lies at our claims to justice and in which, to be candid, your generation's got to do a hell of a lot better That's job right. than mine did. Or mine. Yes, Hi, my name is Aaron Spencer. I'm a going into my second year at Temple Law School and um, spending the summer working with the Navy's Judge Advocate Corps and uh, in the process of applying to them. So Angelina is not as much a minority as she thinks. Um, and I guess my question is, I'm 30. I had a career that I, you know, enjoyed but wasn't passionate about and left to come back to law school. And in the face of uh, the mounting cost of going to law school in this country, um, how do you, do you have any advice for people that are starting over, especially Ms. Morris, since that's what you did. Um, you know, I'll have, I'll tell you, I'll probably, when I get done with law school, I have a total of about $175,000 in student loan debt from a couple of other degrees plus this one. So um, I just wonder if you have any advice for people who are starting over a little bit later in life that aren't like, you know, 24. Or <laughs> well, I wasn't starting over. I just took the slow road <laughs> in my 20s. So I, I, had, I did uh, college in five years. And then I took a year off, and then I went to graduate school in Scotland, and then I took a year off, and then I went to law school. And I, um, and then I clerked for a year. So, um, I mean, I don't want to repeat what I said earlier. I felt like it was really important to throw those shackles off. I had a, over $100,000 in debt, and I just basically put my head down and wiped it out as fast as I could because I wanted to feel free. I wanted to feel free to just go out and into the world and do... I had a job at a public interest law firm that's one of the premier law firms in the country. And I left because it made me feel so weak to have so much debt, so little money. And I was like, this is not, I want to sort of feel strong. I, I don't want to be awake at night wondering if I can pay my bills. I don't want to live that way. And I also don't want to be that person trying to fight for justice. So I, I feel, I mean, one of my sort of pet peeves about the progressive side is that we starve our people and talk a lot about self-sacrifice. And I actually think it's counterproductive. I think we should figure out a way to help people deal with their debt and pay people more so that they feel stronger when they go out to fight these fights that we want them to fight. Thank you. Well, I'm not doing my job, and we've gone over the time, so I'm going to call it uh, to a conclusion. Please uh, join me in uh, thanking uh, these remarkable folks. <laughs>